sure. talk. So yep. do you want to just start off by telling me your name, your title, and where you work? My name is Barrett Goodman. I'm a founder and partner of Arc Media, which is a documentary company in Brooklyn, New York. And how long have you been? Uh, tell me about how, before we go into or talking about ARC and the projects that you've currently worked on. Do you want to tell me a bit about how you actually got your start inside the industry? Right, okay. So ARC Media it has become a rather large production company. Uh, we do upwards of about 20 to 30 hours at least of, of documentary product. <laughs> hate to use that word. Um, every year we're three partners and a lot of support people. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it has been for PBS, but we're increasingly looking outside PBS. We do series, we do feature docs, we do, you know, one-offs, we do up to 10-hour series as well. And uh, it's grown, it was founded by myself, my wife, Rachel Dretson, and we added a third partner, John Maggio, in the, uh, about 2003, I believe. And um, we each have our, our passion projects, but we also oversee producers working on on other projects as well. Um, as far as uh, getting into it, I mean, I, this was an accidental career for me. Um, it was not what I intended to do. I was, I was bound and determined to be a journalist, a print journalist. Um, coming out of college, I went to the Columbia Journalism School for a year. Like a lot of people at Columbia, I'd kinda, I, I sort of had contempt for the, you know, the electronic media. Um, that wasn't real reporting. I wanted to be Tony Lewis at the New York Times, and I wanted to, you know, be a be a foreign correspondent and so on. But shortly after graduating, I realized that to do that, I was going to have to move to some really small market somewhere like Toledo, Ohio, or someplace I didn't really want to live, and spend some years there. And meanwhile, the dean of the school got a call from a local TV station in Philadelphia, which is my hometown looking for a young associate producer to help create a documentary series. Um, and I love documentaries. I just didn't know anything about making them. But he thought I might be interested. He asked me. I said, what the heck? I'll try it for a year. So I moved down to Philadelphia. I worked at a, a local TV station that was very successful and wanted to create a, a, a sort of journalistic-based series to kind of prop up their anchorman, who was a sort of Ted Baxter type. He was a you know, had pretenses of being a real journalist, but wasn't. He was basically a reader. But he wanted to kind of get his hands dirty with something. So I moved down. They hired a fancy English former BBC producer to work with me. The guy barely ever showed up at the station, and so I had the run of the place, essentially. And I learned how to do this. I, I took crews out. I, you know, came up with stories. We actually did a couple of them over the course of a year, and I really learned the craft and fell in love with it. I felt, I felt like it, the chance to bring to bear so many different aspects of storytelling, not just the writing, which I love, but, you know, uh, visual and music and so on, it really appealed to me, and the chance to sit with a story for a long time. So that was about a year, and then we, I moved to New York, and this is the, the other thing, the thing that I always tell young people about my own experience, which I think is instructive, is I was very impatient, and I didn't want to kind of climb the ladder. And there wasn't much of a ladder to climb in those days. It was a very kind of, I didn't know where to go with this career. Like, how do you become a documentary filmmaker? It wasn't clear to me. So I thought that the, probably the best thing to do is just to make a film, just to do it, just to go for it. And I did that, <coughs> two films sort of at simultaneously. Uh, one was a historical documentary um, about the old mayor of Chicago, Richard J. Daley. And, and that was simply going to the NIH, uh, sorry, the NEH at the time, the National Endowment for the Humanities. I surrounded myself with much more experienced people, um, a cameraman, Buddy Squires, who was Ken Burns' cameraman, a writer, Jeff Ward, who was Ken Burns' writer. You see how, <laughs> how, where I'm going with this. It was, it was sort of, you know, I was the young neophyte, but the NEH could be reassured that there were people around me who knew what they were doing. And they gave me the money to make it, and I just did it. I spent several years working on that, made that film. Simultaneously worked on a different film with an old professor of mine from college who was a very famous guy and was able to raise money. So I, I think the important point here is that if you want to make a career in this, the best advice I could give people is to just get your hands dirty however you can. Nowadays, 
it's much easier. You have access to equipment that I couldn't have dreamed of in those days. The cameras, the editing equipment is so much cheaper and easier to use. Um, just go make a film. How Don't did, wait. How did you get involved with these uh, people like Jeffrey Ward, who is such, at that point even, has had such a reputation? Uh, I called them up. Theme. Honestly, I mean, a guy like that, buddy, um, they're nice people. I mean, now it didn't hurt that I was a huge fan of theirs and a huge fan of Ken's at the time. He, he hadn't made Civil War yet. This was just after he did uh, Huey Long, which is a fantastic film. And I knew that film backwards and forwards, and I was able to kind of convey that to them. But I wasn't asking them for that much, really. I wanted them to uh, be on the proposal and to sort of backstop me, um, and they were more than happy to. Um, I think I had thoroughly researched the, the idea. They knew I knew what I was talking about. And they've since become friends, and we've worked together many times. But, you know, I, I, there's this barrier that people feel is there that between them and what they want to do that often isn't there. And it's just a matter of go for it. And, uh, you know, that sounds glib, but, but really that's it's true in some cases. So for most people, that barrier uh, starts and ends with financing. Right. Um, and that's where they automatically hit the wall. They can't, they don't even feel comfortable reaching out to anyone because they're not able to pay them. And right. a lot of time it is just asking people to do them favors. Yeah. Um, how is your experience in moving forward and using places like the NEH or what other organizations have you worked to to fundraise to get your films financed? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I, we've probably worked in every possible permutation. We've raised money. We've been commissioned. I'd say most of the work we've done has been commissioned work. Now, in the last few years, we're pivoting towards, um, again, kind of going out and pitching projects and trying to raise money for them. There are various reasons that we're doing that, uh, mostly because we've grown so much that we really need to go beyond PBS and out into the world. Um, you know, you have to be an entrepreneur. I mean, it's, again, it's, it sounds obvious, and, and is in some ways. Um, you have to, you have to um, make the call that you don't want to make. You have to push. You have to come to a company like mine with a great idea or with something that's kind of, you know, you've shot a little something for already and you want to see it happen, but you can't do it yourself, come to a company like mine, become, um, enter into a, an agreement, a production services agreement where we'll house the project, we'll help you raise the money for it. We have access to the buyers. We know how to, you know, market it. Uh, you'll direct it or we'll, you'll direct it with somebody else. Um, you know, you have to try every angle. I mean, um, I, I would say the most important thing is don't wait to start shooting. In other words, if you've got the skill to, to operate a camera, nowadays it's super easy, um, go get that little bit of tape. Even if you're going to end up reshooting it later, show something. Uh, it's much, much easier to get money when you have something to show, not just something that's written down and a promise of access, but real access. Everybody wants access. In my experience now, we've been out there pitching madly all over the place. The first question everybody has before they'll be interested in the project is what access do you have? What's different about your approach? Do you have something unique? There are a lot of great stories out there, the stories from the past, the present, but the thing that differentiates is the access. And so I would say that if you can get something on tape and either bring it directly to a buyer or through a company like mine to a buyer, mm -hmm. that's the way to do it. When you are putting together a project, let's take your most recent work that just won the Peabody Award. Congratulations, Thank by you. the way. Thank you. Um, you um, Oklahoma City, uh, looking at American terrorism, a homegrown terrorism. Um, how Can you tell me a bit about how these projects uh, start and where they come from, if they're... Uh, and how you see them through the production, how you do get that access to these people that are not exactly media friendly. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that particular case study is, is not particularly illuminating because uh, Oklahoma City and many other th films I've done in the last decade or so were commissioned by American Experience. So mm -hmm. in that case, the exec producer of American Experience, Mark Samuels, who is as smart a filmmaker as there is in this business, 
come, came to me and, and suggested the idea, as he has many other ideas over the years we've worked together, <clears throat> just said, you know, it feels like there's more to this story than it's been told. Like, th this story probably has deep roots, and let's excavate. Let's see what's, what's underneath. And so you start with, you know, what everyone knows about Oklahoma City bombing was that Timothy McVeigh was a, was a you know, an ex-army GI who came home, and he was disgruntled, and he hated the government, and he was crazy about guns, and he blew up a building. Well, that's the first layer, but it didn't take much digging to understand that this story sunk way deep into the soil and that there was actually this whole subculture of white supremacy and uh, anti-government feeling that fueled McVeigh but reached much wider than McVeigh. So, you know, that's what American experience is all about. It's about finding the layers b beneath and finding the surprising, you know, kind of context and and kind of resonance of stories. So we, we began to do that. Um, there were two other major events that, that really became the, the, the sort of tri triangle of, of events that we've really looked at, of stories we really looked at in that film, the other two being Ruby Ridge and Waco. And you can debate what, how connected these were, but they were definitely connected in the mind of Timothy McVeigh. So that justified us going deeply into each of these other stories. and. As we began reporting, we got, you know, really deep into them. And in fact, so deep into the Ruby Ridge story that we actually spun off a separate film just on Ruby Ridge. So the Ruby Ridge piece within the Oklahoma City film is rather small, but there's a whole hour film, you know, that we did afterwards from the material that we shot. Um, you have to have a supportive and... Um, you know, supportive monetarily, supportive time-wise, supportive intellectually. You have to have a, a guy, a boss, who's willing to let you run with a story like that. American Experience is one of the best places to work in television because you've got a guy there who understands it takes time and, and encourages you to find the gray and find the nuance in stories. It's not always like that. You know, my wife is working on a six-part series right now, and She's got wonderful execs too, but she's got a much smaller budget, a much shorter time period. This, you know, there's, there imposes limits. Um, but you know, we've done so. That's the best of all possible worlds. In, you know, the scenario of being commissioned and having a good budget and so on. But you have to you have to get to that place. Um, you know, it, there's all sorts of different models and different. Um, and and I'd say. The common denominator is great storytelling and great reporting, and um, keeping an open mind about a story, not not thinking you know what a story is going into it, has been the crucial thing in my career. And that that comes from my background as a journalist, as a print journalist. I think a lot of filmmakers are not trained to be journalists or reporters. They they become polemicists, and that's really shuts down. I think, you know, lots of interesting filmmaking because people already think they know what they want to say and they go out and make a film to make a point mm -hmm. and I don't find those films interesting and I feel like they don't go very well in general so I guess to answer your question in a long-winded way how do you tell a story how do you see it through it's really about following it where it takes you and not sort of imposing on it your vision you know a priori but keep asking questions of yourself, of the story, of your, of your interview subjects, keep probing, and then something will emerge that's really special. Do you have an order in that you like to collect information and the way before you get to the editing room, um, do you f use the footage that you've found, either archival footage or found footage or materials that you've got from I, I, sources I can't even imagine because there are some clips in um, like Ruby Ridge yeah. that you're actually on these in these churches with white supremacists yeah. um, or there as an example um, and then there's the interviews that you do it's right. like how do you like to go about piecing together a story I generally do the interviews first but I I, I wish I more often did what for example Stanley Nelson does which is to which is to screen every bit of archival I think he can and then to do the interviews and then to lead people through the interviews, knowing what you have archivally to work on. Y you often see in his films, for example, people talking about 
events that are, it's so closely wed to the archival footage, they're really describing what you see, and that's because he's already seen it before he goes to the interview and can really take people through it. Um, generally speaking, I, again, this harkens back to the days as a print reporter, I start with the interviews, and that tells me what the story is, and, and then we sort of, I mean, simultaneously, but we ended up, you know, then going to the archival after that. And this is, with historical films mostly, it's like, you build it out of the archival, but the interviews are, are first for me. Um, that, you know, again, I don't think, I, I think it's a mistake to sort of have a, a, a sort of um, formula for doing this. I think every film has a different DNA and will tell you what it wants to be, and sometimes the archival is so essential. You alluded to some of the stuff in Ruby Ridge, for example. We had this footage that was found footage of um, the U.S. Marshals who were essentially uh, staking out the cabin in the mountains of Idaho <coughs> around Ruby Ridge. And we had this incredible footage of them sneaking around, spying on the cabin where the Weaver family was holed up. And then we had this footage of the day of the actual raid that led to the, uh, people remember the story, but led to the violence up there. And you could see the, you could hear the dog barking and the shots fired and the, you know, the, 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 the agents dry, you know, running from the, from the scene. I mean, footage like that, you know, that t that's, that's the story, that's the heart of the story, and you build the story around it. Stuff like that's rare to find, you know, really unique footage like that, but when you find it, everything else goes away and that becomes the heart of it. How did you find it? Uh, my co-producer, Emily uh, Chapman, found it by simply asking the question of one of the marshals, do you have anything that in your, in your garage or in your basement? And in that case, he had, uh, he had actually donated this footage to an obscure sort of college library somewhere in the Northwest, and nobody had gone through it. The, the, the archive itself hadn't looked at it. It was old VHS tape. Among a lot of, I think, irrelevant stuff was the, were, were these few tapes that they had shot right, you know, I don't have any idea why they had a camera with them while they were doing this, some kind of training exercise or whatever it was, but, you know, they, they had this tape. And, and again, it's just asking the simple question, you know, the, the prima facie question, you know, and we do that now with everybody, <laughs> we, every subject in the film. Do you have anything? Do you have... There have been countless, many examples throughout my career of, of finding stuff that was hiding in plain sight just by asking. Uh, as a documentary filmmaker, though, um, there are times when you are not able to get that right. key information sure. or that key piece of um, footage. How do you, as a filmmaker, work around scenarios where there's something that you know needs to be in the story, mm. but you're not getting whether through the subject or through archival footage. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of, uh, when you mentioned that, I'm thinking of a, a four-hour biography of Bill Clinton that we did um, some years ago. And the, Lin and the um, Monica Lewinsky story was very important in that film, obviously, and she wouldn't talk to us, nor would Linda Tripp, her nemesis. I don't know if people remember all that stuff. But, um, you know... It's just, it's storytelling. You find a way. I mean, I I in that case, we had the luxury of narration that could cover us in some ways f to go from point A to point B where you didn't need that piece of footage to do it for you. But um, I it's, it's, you know, bringing to bear all the techniques of documentary filmmaking. And, and um, sometimes you have to create impressionistic sort of recreations to cover, particularly in historical films that were you know, where there's, you can be pre-archival, or it's just no archival at all, and you have to create something to convey without trying to, you know, hit it on the head and be cheesy about it, something to convey uh, an atmosphere or a, a set of actions that are, you know, that for which there are no pictures or, or footage. We've done that a lot. The, I think only once did I go for a kind of full-on, you know, actors and costumes and kind of, you know, um, I don't think it was dialogue, but it was everything but dialogue. I did that once, and I really didn't like doing it, um, and I never did it again. But sometimes you see that done very well. In fact, I think increasingly there are films that blur the line between, um, you know, really documentary and feature filmmaking, and sometimes very effectively. Well, let's talk about a project that you uh, started and that you conceived of. Mm -hmm. And can you talk me 
through how you uh, went about the, uh, did you first start off with a proposal or an outline um, and how you took it from there into creating uh, an actual uh, piece that was ready to show? I know you've had a couple things that have debuted at like Sundance, for instance. Yeah, so. we've had three films here. Um, yeah, I mean, th earlier in my career, I did more of that. And I think, I, for me, the best example and really the best filmmaking experience I've ever had was a film called Scottsboro. It was actually nominated for an Academy Award ba way back in 2001. But this was a story that I read about in a book. Just I actually heard this book extolled on, on C-SPAN or something as one of the best nonfiction books of the year. Never heard of it, never heard of the story, never heard of the writer. I picked it up and... Um, loved it. It was a story about this depression era ca uh, legal case in which eight young black boys had been accused of raping two white women by, you know, by these women. Uh, and the Communist Party had come down to Alabama to defend them. And it, it had become a huge cause to lab. They were innocent of the charges, but it took 20 years for their innocence to be established. And it was full of twists and turns and amazing, amazing um, storytelling. And so... The process was was pretty logical. I, I called up the writer of the book. He was enthusiastic. In those days, there wasn't a feeding frenzy every time a book came out, so he had not heard from anybody else, and it, we quickly had a had an arrangement. Um, I then, um, as I recall, were you I got, able to get that rights without? I don't fee? think there was any fees, and in fact, I rarely have have exchanged, you know, uh, optioned formally optioned books. I think it's happened two or three times in my career. Very often you can hire these people as consultants or, you know, and they're very happy to do that. When you have a big book, mm -hmm. it's different. We did a, a series on cancer recently where we really did have to option the book, but particularly in those days, it was easier just to kind of call somebody up. Again, mm -hmm. there's, there's the th common thread. Just call them up and they love the idea, right? So we went to the NEH again with a, and there was a, pr I, by that time I learned their formula for how to do the NEH application. Probably is pretty much the same now. You have to create a board of advisors who are very involved and you have to tease out of this film the big humanities themes that they want to hear about. Um, you have to write a script that's good storytelling um, for those people on the panel who are filmmakers or storytellers. Anyway, it, it all came together. Um, we. It took, I think, a couple of rounds, as I recall. We got rejected once, and then we went back with corrections, and then they funded it. Uh, but there was no idea of where this film would end up. We just sat, we just made the film again. My, I had a partner back then. It was a wonderful experience going to the South. The, you know, I think it was in the 1990s. I mean, there were still people alive who had lived through this, who could kind of be on camera with us. Um, and... Um, we sat in a dark room editing this thing, and we sent it kind of on spec once it was kind of in rough cut to American Experience. I'd done one film for them several years before. They didn't know who I was, really. Um, it basically sat on a shelf unwatched up there until it got into Sundance. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the next day, they called me and said, we want this film, we'll commission it, you know, and so forth. Um, it was a real passion project, and thank God, there was an organization like the NEH that could, su you know, sustain a filmmaker through the year or two years it took to make this. I wasn't making a lot of money, but enough to get by and um, and really pour myself into something that is still probably the best film I've ever made. So, you know, it's it's about coming to the coming together of your passion, you know, a vision that can sell somebody else who's in a position to fund something, a lot of drive. Um, a really great story that's obviously the first and foremost. When you are putting that together, uh, the final project product, how close was it to what you had originally drafted out? Completely the same. I mean, it, it, no one had touched, I mean, there was nobody around, no one knew we were making this except mm -hmm. for the NEH, and they are wonderful about staying out of the filmmaking process, which is why I think the film worked so well, because I think a lot of films are taken backwards by the fact that there are lots of people involved in you know, pulling this thread and you know, lots of notes and contradictory notes and so on. We really were left alone. And then ultimately, when we sent it to American, to American Experience and ultimately they bought it, there were five changes that we had to make, nothing. I mean, it was, it was really our film and our vision and the passion we had kind of came through. And I think that's why 
it worked. I mean, um, now, you know, bookending, we've come full circle, and I'm back to a film that I'm very, very excited about now doing. Um, uh, it's, it's, I guess I can reveal it. It's a story. Uh, it's, it's the Biosphere 2 story. I'm sure people don't remember too well. You remember. Your, your eyes are lighting up. Uh, it's <laughs> a crazy story. I remember this. It is a crazy it's story. It's a crazy story, <laughs> but we were doing it in a slightly different way. Where it, it's, for those who don't remember, it was this gigantic structure that was built in the Arizona desert, and eight, eight sort of visionary people went into it for two years to live in a self-sustained way with growing their own food and living in a kind of simulacrum of the earth inside this huge white dome and all sorts of crazy things ensued. But it is, it was an experiment before its time and those people have gone on to become very interesting kind of leaders of the environmental movement and so we want to place it in the context of the environmental movement. But it's been a very difficult film to get off the ground, not, mostly because the participants themselves were very suspicious of our intentions. And we have, you know, really pushed this and it's taken a couple of years to get them to trust us and to be sort of on board. Now with them on board, we, we, we are working with a, another production company that has um, a long track record of doing environmental films and it looks like it's getting traction, but it's been a long, again, uh, fueled by just a very, you know, we really want to do this film. This is like something we're not going to give up on until we, until we see it through. Um, and we, you know, we're putting in the time. We have the time because we have a lot of other films to keep us going. But, like, it's, it's it feels good again to be that entrepreneurial and to be back and kind of you know just pushing, pushing you know a passion project. How do you go about getting these partner organizations? What's your approach to not only getting uh, partners but also to get financiers? Is it similar? We've recently, as I alluded to earlier, we've just in the last two years become a one of these companies that now has gone, it, it, I didn't even know this world existed, but there's a world of pitching projects, right? We were sort of, uh, um, we were in the PBS fold and we were commissioned and our company was sustained by public television. And we decided a few years ago that was a bad strategy for the company. And besides, we would like to do different kinds of things and we'd like to originate our own ideas and we wanted to own our own ideas. So we got an agent, we got a, a development director with a lot of experience, and we began going out to these pitch meetings with um, all the networks, all the buyers, and there are more of them now than there ever have been, and that's the good news. So the Netflix and the Hulus and the Amazons and the Discovery you know, Network and the, you name it, CNN, everybody. Uh, the agent would put together the meetings, um, we would go there, they would listen politely to our ideas. Most often they would say, the great idea, not for us. Um, that's happened 90% of the time. But once in a while, and it's now a few times, we've gotten real interest and then finally a sale. Um, and that's not advice for like a young filmmaker just coming up because I think it's hard to get an agent and it's hard to, um, it's hard to get seen by these networks. But that said, we are now starting to work with a lot of young documentary filmmakers who've come to us with ideas and with some tape. And they've said, let us, you know, please help us sell this. And, and you know, we'll do the film at Arc Media, but we, we need your help as exec producers or senior producers or whatever to help it get sold and then to help us make it. Because a lot of these people have never tried to do something on a, on a scale or made a series or whatever. And we are now working with two or three of these projects that we've really liked. We get the access to the buyers, and they bring us the idea. And a couple of them are great. Um, so that's another model. You know, again, uh, it doesn't have to be us. There, there are, you know, a dozen, two dozen of these companies. Jigsaw, for example, Alex Gibney's company. Um, you know, there are a lot of them. And. Uh, I think that's a good route if you've got a really good idea, but n you, you just don't have the name or the experience yet to to compel a buyer to sit down with you. Well, given these new roles that you're taking on, <coughs> do you still consider yourself more of a journalist, a filmmaker, yeah. or a producer at this time? I, I, I'm a filmmaker. I, I have been forced by circumstance to be increasingly like a producer slash manager of other people's projects, but 
that's not where my heart is or really my talent is or skill. I mean, I do that, if, um, but I like to go into the office, close the door, sit, write, think, you know, go out into the field, do the interviews. I, I'm not a really a business person. We have some people in the company who are good at that. I'm not good at that. So, um, yeah, my heart is still in journalism. What, where do you do your writing? How do you write and what kind of writing do you do for a project? Uh, I love to write. That's my favorite part of the process. Um, my process is I have my computer and I plug it into this giant monitor so I can, because I can't stand looking at a little screen all day. And I look at that monitor and, and I, it's a, it's a dialectic. It's back and forth between the material and the, and the written word. And, you know, increasingly we're trying to do films without narration. So they're less, less I, when I say writing, it's not just narration. It's sort of knitting together the film, right? Um, and that's where the that's where the pie comes. That's the buzz for me. It's just that creative process of, of of seeing out of a mass of material, seeing a sequence emerge. That's the thrill I think for any filmmaker. So um, I just you know I'm notorious in my company for going in and closing the door and merging eight hours. You know my wife has people in and out of the office all day, and uh, so does my other partner John. But I'm just uh, very hermetic about it. I just go in and it's like don't bother me. <laughs> Let me work. Now uh, when <laughs> Give me an example of a of a, a scene that you have shot mm. that you really oh from. Boy. Let's go. Let's. Uh, I'm going to use. Can we use Oklahoma City or sure, is there a project yeah, you prefer absolutely. to go to? No, let's That's that a different one. Like a scene from Oklahoma City that you captured, whether through found footage or through interviews or through dialogue you have, or through narration that you felt really captured the essence of the entire project of what you were trying to achieve, like where you got that message. Right. Um, sure. I mean, it's hard because, you know, you hope that most of your scenes do that. But I think, like, for example, in Oklahoma City, as a scene that I'm, or a sequence that I'm very proud of is um, we had to condense the entire investigation in, into, into McVeigh. In other words, from the moment of the bombing to the arrest of McVeigh in probably 15 minutes of screen time, and it was a very complex investigation, but it was also just I just a really, you know, incredible ride. And so we, I had an amazing editor on that project, Don Clezzi, um, who's brilliant at using archival footage. And there was almost an overabundance of it in this case, um, in the case of this, this particular story. So, so we, we kind of, you know, with music and with a kind of a lot of, con you know, condensing and shorthand and no narration, but, you know, very short, quick bites, people, you know, building on each other, were able to really make a very kind of compressed but very taut, you know, sequence out of that whole investigation. And we were, again, blessed with amazing interviews from the FBI, investigators involved in that case, um, from a couple of journalists who had covered it, um, and then just amazing footage. And some of the footage in there was reenacted, very, very limited, but there was a little bit of stuff. We had, for example, the POV of McVeigh as he comes into Oklahoma City with his ride of truck, parks it next to the Murrah building. That had to be kind of reenacted, and we did that um, with some old archival and then some stuff that we added to it. But um, it was just, it, what was exciting about it was it used all the kind of arrows in the quiver, you know, used a lot of different techniques and a lot of different, and kind of made it seamless, and I, lo I, I love that sequence. It, it, let's take that sequence for a second and talk about it. Um, when oh. you're piecing that together, um, how much of it is, comes together in the editing room, and, uh, or yeah. is it like really thought, thought through prior to you getting into the editing room? It's always thought through prior, I mean, I'm someone who scripts pretty much everything. And, and um, by that, again, I don't necessarily mean narration, but what my process is, first of all, to write, and, and American Experience, for example, demands this, a, a, an initial treatment where I'm essentially imagining the bites. I'm creating them out of whole cloth because I, I know who I want to interview. I don't know what they're going to say exactly. I may have pre-interviewed them. I, I have a sense of what they're going to say. So I create a script that is more like a piece of fiction than it is a documentary script. But it, it helps me 
to understand connections. It helps me understand how the story might be told. And it gives me, out of this sort of wide open space, a, a direction so that when I go to the interviews, it's not open-ended. I know what I want to try to get from people. So that step is important. We then get the material. And then I build long sequences of bites. We call them string outs. So whatever subject in the Clinton uh, example, there was you know long string outs on the Monica Lewinsky story, long string outs on the Whitewater story, long string outs on the you know Bosnia War, whatever it is, the various pieces of the film, you do you all you aggregate all your best material and see again, connections start to reveal themselves um, before you've gone into the edit room, just on paper. Once those sequences are cut, usually by an assistant editor, they're turned over to the real editor, and then that person starts to play with archival and starts to marry and starts to remove a lot, some of the interviews and let the picture do the storytelling. Writing then might also perform that function if there's narration. You know, you, you give some of the storytelling to the narrator if it's particularly complicated or difficult. We, we've done a couple of major science series where we needed narration because it's too hard to try to convey some of these ideas just through bites and through archival. Anyway, um, it, it, it's a symbiotic process. It's a back and forth between, you know, what you thought the story was, what the story is revealing itself to be, the archival and how it can take over some of the storytelling for you. Um, oftentimes an editor will bring a whole nother sensibility, which is why I like working with editors who are real storytellers, because they will bring a whole new sort of vision to it. Um, which is very productive, I think. And it's all just kind of works together. It's a little bit like, I, I imagine, what a chef is, you know, adding this ingredient and that ingredient, tasting it, seeing if it, you know, works together or doesn't, starting over. It's a little bit like that. In terms of the challenges, um, it, I want to know what are some of the challenges to documentary filmmaking that you first encountered when you were younger versus challenges you now have working and how things have progressed or changed? Uh, it certainly hasn't gotten any easier. I mean, I think every film is, y you reach a point and you always forget, I, I find that you always forget in the midst of it that it's happened every single time before, but there's always that moment where you're like, I don't have a story, this thing is gonna be a disaster. It's the Hindenburg, it's going down in flames, you know? I have that moment practically every film. We, there's never an easy film. There's always something. I'm doing a film right now on Woodstock, having a horrible time <laughs> with it. It's really hard. And, um, and yet I know, I mean, I, I have faith that we'll figure it out because, you know, there is a story there. And so long as there's a story there, you'll figure out the way to do it. Again, it's sometimes a little more obscure and sometimes take a little more digging to sort of find what the film wants to be. But... Um, but you know it's a process, and it's 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 never easy. And and you know, one hopes that they you can kind of solve the business stuff and kind of get that out of the way, so you can just focus on the creative, because that stuff is just a distraction and kind of you know a pain. And there's there's usually some of that involved too, sort of execs who don't know what they're talking about or putting pressure on you or taking money away from you or not giving you enough money or whatever, getting in the way and whatever, that's their job, it seems. But, um, you know, the, 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 the ideal situation is when you don't have, when someone has, you know, protected you from all that and you can just focus on the filmmaking. That's not easy either. That's always, as I said, there's always that, you know, moment of panic. But I've been through it enough at this point to sort of be able to say, okay, you know, calm down, take a deep breath, you'll get, you'll, you'll figure it out, we'll figure it out as a team. And we, we pretty much always do in one way or another. Well, what are some tools that you would say are, people might not think that they need going in, or might not think of going into a project and that are absolutely necessary to achieve what you're doing, making a film? Patience, um, drive, and I think, again, an, an open mind. I, th I find so many, particularly young filmmakers, lack that basic wonder um, and, 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 and a persistent interrogation of what you're doing. Like, don't ever stop asking yourself n new questions. Um, I'm doing a particularly really complicated film right now on politics, on sort of democracy, and... It's about gerrymandering and voter suppression, and it's very complicated, and there's all sorts of 
difficult connections to make. And it's, it's, I love it because it does present this intellectual puzzle, but it's very important to keep challenging what you think you, you know about something. Um, there are many examples in my career where film has taken a right turn or a left turn and midway through. And, and I think it's been one of the things that has been most important to, you know, the success we've had is that it's, we, we were trained as journalists early on to, to have that open mind, to have that repertorial sort of point of view as you're, as you're producing. And, and not to kind of ever, until something's locked, um, stop asking those questions. Is it a different uh, approach when you're making something that's involving current affairs versus something that's historical? Yeah, not at all. No, it's the same thing. It's storytelling. It's, 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 it, I think it's particularly important with something historical because there is this sense that you think you know the story. There's a sense that, oh, well, this book has been written about it, so this must be the way it is. And... Um, Mark Samuels at American Experience very much rejects that point of view, and I think it's very important not to get locked into any one point of view on something. He asked me to do a film on the My Lai Massacre five or six years ago, or maybe more at this point, and we didn't know what the story was. We just thought this was, again, there's got to be some more to it than what people think they know, and it turned out to be this incredibly rich territory where the people involved, the GIs, the young soldiers involved in that massacre were far from the monsters that they'd been portrayed and were actually, in a way, victims themselves of a war and a mentality and a kind of failure of leadership that led to the events. And we were able to excavate all of that. And that really is so thrilling to be able to turn a story in, a, in, a, in another angle and see it from another way. And to do that, my point is you need to keep that open mind. You can't go into it saying, here's what the film's about. Let's do it this way. That's a great point, and I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. It's fun. Um, is there any parting advice that you would give to young filmmakers? Just become pains in the ass. Just, just, just call. Just you know, persist. Don't, don't let anything stand in your way if you're passionate about a film. Um, call up people like me or my wife or anybody else who's, who's been around a while, get advice. We're happy to give it, as you can probably tell from this interview. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. you taking the time to speak with us. Thanks so much.